The Juno World Affairs Council presents Blueprints for a More Modern U.S. Diplomatic Service with Ambassador Dan Smith. Recently retired from the Foreign Service, Smith is an award-winning U.S. diplomat, passionate about training the next generation. In addition to numerous postings abroad, he was a director of the Foreign Service Institute, was the State Department's 2020 Presidential Transition Director, and then Acting Secretary of State in the early months of the Biden administration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl, for that unique introduction. I, I don't think I've had one from a, what was it, a, a royal commander? What is the title? Lord Commander. Lord Commander, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm duly impressed. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to Juno. I'm really delighted to be here uh, and speaking to the members of the Juno World Affairs Council. This is a unique opportunity for me and for my wife. The first time, actually, we've been to Alaska. We retired after I left the Foreign Service to Colorado, so I'm used to mountains, but I'm not used to the water you have, and it's just a spectacular combination. So we look forward to coming back, uh, maybe in a little uh, warmer <laughs> days. Um, before I get started today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the background to this project, which is the blueprints for a more modern U.S. diplomatic service, and give you an idea of why we undertook this and, and what it means, I think, and the significance of this, this project. You know, reports on reforming the Department of State or the Foreign Service uh, are uh, legion in the, in the Washington area, but rarely known outside the Beltway, as we say, in Washington. Um, and, and rather than have one more report that collected dust or now is scattered in the iCloud somewhere, we wanted to do something that was practical and pragmatic. So we, we wanted to make a difference. Uh, we wanted something that would capture not just attention on Capitol Hill, which is obviously important in terms of the State Department budget, but also that we could explain to the American people. So that's why I'm here and, and delighted to be here, thanks to the auspices of the Unit Chapman Cox Foundation and the American Academy of Diplomacy. In preparing these blueprints, as I say, we, I will use slides, I'm sorry, I'm not so accustomed to, but in preparing these blueprints, what we wanted to do was build on a foundation of a report that came out in November 2020. Uh, this was sponsored by the Harvard Kennedy Center, the Belf Harvard Kennedy School, the Belfer Center, on, on uh, creating a more modern U.S. diplomatic service for the 21st century. We start to focus on four key areas uh, within that report. The first is defining the, a revised mission and mandate for the Department of State, and I'll explain why that is important. The second is increasing the capacities of our diplomats through further education and training. The third is making the State Department personnel system more flexible, more adaptive to the challenges we face. And the final one, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this, is, is establishing a reserve diplomatic corps, which I think is a unique idea, something that I hope that gains traction, that would allow us not just to tap into former diplomats, but I, I think a lot of private citizens who would be willing to volunteer and contribute their time and expertise to our mission overseas. And toward this end, in this blueprints, uh, something I'll commend it, I think, is that we tried to, to make it as easy as possible for Congress. So we created actually legislative language and regulatory changes that could be implemented uh, very easily by members of Congress should they prove willing to do that. But what I'd like to do is, is uh, before I spend the bulk of my time talking about these blueprints and why I think they're important, uh, I thought I'd say a few words about why this matters. And I know this is, to a large extent, preaching to the choir. You all are interested in foreign affairs and in, in uh, international affairs and, and diplomacy. But uh, as someone who spent their career, in fact, 38 years in the Foreign Service of the Department of State, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had to explain to somebody what a Foreign Service officer does, what the State Department does, why it's different from the State Department of all of our 50 states, why its role is different and, and its importance is different in that regard. Um, and I use actually a quote from a former Secretary of Defense to illustrate the importance of the State Department. It was James Mattis who said, you know, if you cut the State Department budget, you need to give me more ammunition. The State Department is really the, the front lines of our national security, of our national defense. Uh, every bit as important as our military, but also as our intelligence community. And yet it always struggles 
for resources, for attention, uh, and for support in that regard. And I think there are many reasons why that is the case. Um, but the most important one, I think, is we have not done a good job, and I mean we collectively have had the privilege of serving in the State Department, in telling our story, in telling why it matters, why Americans should care, and what it is we do to, to help them and to help uh, advance our national security. You'd think, in some respects, it, it's sort of counterintuitive, because um, if you travel abroad, and most of you do, <laughs> especially from Alaska, travel abroad, um, you realize that the, if you're in trouble, if you lose your passport, if you have a medical emergency, or heaven forbid you get arrested, or whatever it might be in a foreign country, the first person you're going to encounter is probably a consular officer of the diplomatic service of the, of the United States. Um, and in fact, of course, the reason I am here is thanks to the generosity of someone who was aided by a consular officer. The Una Chapman Cox Foundation was founded by a woman who in 1948 found herself in India in trouble without her passport. And it was thanks to a consular officer that she was rescued and brought back to her ship. And ever since then, she was enormously grateful and took her fortune, which happened to be substantial, and founded the Una Cap Chapman Cox Foundation, whose mission is to support the State Department, support the Foreign Service, uh, and advance our work uh, as much as she could. So it's actually thanks to the generosity of a cons or a, the work of a consular officer and the generosity of an American citizen that I'm actually here today. But I think despite the fact that any American who gets in trouble is likely to encounter a, a diplomat or a foreign service officer or a consular officer, there are popular misconceptions about our diplomacy and about how much money we spend on foreign assistance or diplomacy. Uh, if you ask most Americans, and we have done this in many polls, how much they think of our federal budget is spent on foreign assistance, the figure that is given is usually 25 percent. The reality is around 1 percent. So if you think about how much money we spend, <coughs> excuse me, and what we get for that money, it's significant in, in terms of that, but it's, there is a popular misconception about what we do. And as I say, I think a large part we in the diplomatic service, in the foreign service, in the State Department are to blame for this. We have not done a good job of explaining to the American people what we do for them, how we advance their interests. Um, we haven't talked about the jobs that we create because of opening opportunities for American business. We don't talk about our efforts to build coalitions to fight everything from Russian aggression in, in Ukraine to climate change. Uh, we don't talk about our efforts to deal with what are so-called problems without passports, like counter-narcotics or, or trafficking in persons. Um, and we don't do a good job of, of, of uh, as I say, sort of telling the world how we are engaged in almost every issue that involves the United States and the world, and how we advance our interests and work to support our interests in those different capacities. By the way, I, I, since I raised climate change, I have to ask, uh, about 20 years ago, I worked for Frank Loy, who was then the Undersecretary for Global Affairs, and among other things, his job was as Chief Climate Negotiator for the United States. And I remember distinctly, on his wall, he had a photograph pinned up from a group in T-shirts, in sunshine, uh, with the T-shirts that read, Alaskans for Global Warming. So I wanted to ask you all if that is really a group or <laughs> any group. We all thought it was tongue in cheek, but I don't know. You have to tell me whether that was the case. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to belabor uh, more the need to build a domestic constituency for the State Department, but I wanted to talk about the actual blueprints themselves and go into a little bit of detail about them. There are really there are four, as I say. The first is our mission and mandate. One of the most important points in this area of mission and mandate is that U.S. diplomacy must be led by professionals who are well-trained, well-resourced, and equipped to carry out the job that they're given. We have a challenge in this regard, not in so much attracting or recruiting a talented workforce, but in the fact that so many of our missions overseas, in fact a third, are led by non-career professionals. 
that is unique, I will tell you, in the world. When you encounter foreign diplomats and you tell them that we have that many non-career professionals leading our missions, there's a look of astoundment on their, on their, <laughs> on their faces uh, that we are in, in, encounter this situation. Now, I will say, I want to make this very clear, I have worked with non-career professionals who are outstanding ambassadors and leaders of U.S. foreign policy. And they have done everything they could to advance our interest and to lead our diplomacy abroad effectively. But I, I, there is, and this is not just a, a caricature, but there are many instances where people are named to be ambassador mainly because of the size of their donation to political campaigns. That's not really the way you should conduct diplomacy or you really should lead our missions abroad. We need to have a system that holds everybody to account, that makes sure anybody we are sending abroad to be an ambassador is held to the highest standards and, and can conduct that diplomacy effectively. We learned this lesson, by the way, in the Civil War, we used to have political generals and decided as a result of that war that that was not a good idea. I'm not advocating for getting rid of political appointees or political ambassadors. I am saying, though, that they have to be held to the highest standards, and that is one of the elements of that blueprint. Our diplomatic corps also, though, must represent the most highly trained uh, professionals who are leading all of our government's efforts overseas. Most of you are probably aware that the State Department is only a fraction of what we have when we come to a mission, when we're staffing our missions abroad. We have the Department of Agriculture. We have the Department of Commerce. We have all sorts of agencies abroad. My last job overseas was a charge in India. And in India, uh, I was remark it, it was remarkable to me to, to realize that one of the biggest presence we had was the Centers for Disease Control um, and USAID, who were obviously very key components of what we were doing with the Indians. This was, by the way, in the course of the second wave of the pandemic that I was there. I can talk more about that if you're interested. But um, it was illustrative of how broad our overseas representation is. But the key point in this regard is that the ambassador must be the chief of everybody there. He must be and she must be empowered by the, the President of the United States to lead that mission and to coordinate that mission and coordinate everybody who is, is represented there. The only exception to that, really, should be those who are under direct uh, command of a, of a combatant commander abroad. Otherwise, they should be under the chief of mission. So toward that end, one of the things we call for is an enhanced letter of instruction. Every ambassador gets a letter of instruction from the President. We need to make this as clear and crystal clear as we can about the authorities of the chief of mission and the responsibility of that chief of mission for conducting all of American diplomacy in their country or in their mission. Uh, we also need to carefully, though, balance risk and opportunities. And this is something my colleagues and I, in, in writing these blueprints, feel very strongly about. You know, this is dangerous work. We've had a number of diplomats who've been killed in the line of service. In fact, until recent wars, it was much more common for, to lose a diplomat than it was to lose a soldier overseas. Uh, we've had bombings in East Africa. We've had, uh, of course, the, the loss of, of an ambassador in Benghazi. It, it is a risky business, um, but we are there to do a job. And we feel that it's important that we balance those risks and those opportunities. If we are unable to get outside the walls of our mission, if we are unable to engage with the societies where we are stationed, we're not doing our jobs. And we think that the ambassador must be prepared to, and, and empowered to make those calculations about cost and benefit in terms of engagement abroad and not be second guessed any more than a, than a commander would in that standpoint. The final thing of this blueprint uh, calls for enhancing the role of the State Department in the interagency process, and, and I can get into that sort of sausage making if you're interested in it, but it's an important element in terms of the role of the State Department vis-a-vis -vis the National Security Council and how the National Security Council has gained authority and control over time, which we think is a mistake in certain areas. And, and finally, uh, to, just to underscore the point I've already made, we need to engage more broadly with the American public, and that's a key part of that blueprint. The second blueprint is on education and training, and I'm embarrassed to admit, because I was the co-author of this blueprint that is the best written of the four blueprints, um, but essentially this blueprint recognizes that to have the best foreign and civil service employees in the State Department, 
we need to invest in their education and professional development. We compare ourselves in this regard to the U.S. military. The U.S. military has a training float of around 15% of their personnel. Now that is used for a variety of things, perhaps not relevant necessarily to the Foreign Service, but our uh, training float is only 4%. And most of that is used for language training. Uh, I was head, as, as Carl mentioned, of the uh, Foreign Service Institute, which is the training center for the State Department and, and much of the Foreign Affairs Agency. And we teach there over 70 languages. Um, and a large part of our uh, budget is devoted to that language training. So everything from a brush up in German, if you happen to speak German before you go overseas, to two years in the case of a hard language like Chinese or Japanese, Korean or Arabic where you spend a year learning the language in Washington and Arlington at our beautiful campus, and then a year overseas. This is a huge investment that the State Department makes in its personnel, but that's the largely the, the focus of that training float. We need much more than that. And this blueprint calls for training and professional development at all stages of the career, at mid-career, at senior levels, to make sure that we have the best prepared leaders to conduct our foreign policy abroad. And this doesn't, uh, training by the way, it should, does not have to take place exclusively in Washington. In fact, we think there would be a, a great benefit from sending more diplomats out for education at, throughout the United States. Uh, it would be great to have diplomats and residents here in Alaska studying international affairs and, and, and learning more about our, their country in the course of it. I think they could aga again engage as, as diplomats and as representatives of the State Department telling the story of the State Department, but they could also uh, learn from that experience and hopefully recruit people. One of the jobs of, of us as, as diplomats uh, traveling abroad in, in the United States is to get people interested in careers in the Foreign Service. Uh, we love to talk about our experience and how do you become a Foreign Service officer. We've done a much better job over time in terms of diversity, both in terms of ethnicity and gender, but also geographic diversity. You know, the State Department was known for so long as, as Yale, pale, and male. Um, it's no longer the case. Uh, we represent everybody. I grew up in Colorado. We have people from all over the, the United States, and I think that adds to our strength uh, as an institution in that regard. So we'd, we'd like to do that. So we call basically for doubling the training float, or we call it a training complement, to, to 8%. We think that would accomplish what we need to do in terms of professional education and training at all levels of a career, um, as I say, spread, spread around the, the country. But the, the challenge is not, I will be very candid, the challenge is not simply getting more resources for this, it's also changing the culture. The military has a culture of education and training. You know, it, it is expected that in each level of your career, if you're an officer, you will go off for sometimes a year, sometimes two years of training. That's not been the tradition in the State Department, and we need to change that. We need to make it more a part of our DNA in that regard if we're going to be successful. The third is, uh, of the blueprints is personnel, the personnel system. Um, we recruit, as I say, a very incredibly talented and diverse workforce, but we need to do more to transform this personnel system to make it more modern, more flexible, and transparent, diverse, and strategically focused. In particular, this calls for new pathways to produce senior leaders who have, throughout their careers, learned to lead and manage complex organizations so that they are prepared to be chiefs of mission abroad. We need to make sure that we've got the right people in the right place at the right time. Among other things, this calls for actually a reapportioning of some of our, our missions. We created, in the aftermath of the Iraq and Afghan wars, huge missions in these countries. Now, Afghanistan is, is no longer a mission, and I can talk to you more about that as the uh, architect of the uh, After Action Review on the withdrawal from Afghanistan. But in general, we need to get away from that model and create more flexible models where we are positioned to do the job that we need to do around the world. There are a number of other proposals in this blueprint, including creating a more structured and vigorous approach to recruitment, ways to ensure that employees get multifunctional skills they will need to succeed in higher levels, promotion criteria, that is focused on performance and holding people accountable, which is a challenge in government, I will tell you, and modifying the assignment process to ensure that employees receive the cross-cutting skills and breadth of experience they need to succeed at higher levels in the institution. 
Finally, the blueprint recognizes that, that we don't just send abroad individuals in most instances, we're sending abroad families. We need to do more to take care of those families, to provide opportunities for spouses and significant others so that they can pursue their career experiences and career opportunities while they're abroad. That is a major problem in terms of uh, retention in the State Department, I will tell you. The fourth and final blueprint calls, as I say, for the creation of a diplomatic reserve corps. Along with education and training, this is probably the most transformational of the th four blueprints, but also the more, uh, excuse me, the most uh, uh, resource intense. What we're trying to do is duplicate in a way what the military has in its reserve. We need to create a trained reserve of both, as I say, retired senior diplomats and, and, and other diplomats, uh, other foreign service uh, personnel, but also a senior diplomatic reserve corps that draws from the expertise of the American public. People who are willing to dedicate themselves to come for one weekend a month and, and train just as the military reserve would train, to be deployed in very difficult circumstances and environment. This came home, by the way, when I did the after action review of Afghanistan. We often send abroad into very difficult circumstances foreign and civil service officers without the preparation that they need. We expect them to do well because they're smart and we've, we've had a good hiring process, but that's not adequate. You need to prepare people for what they're gonna face, for the challenges they're gonna face. You need to have people trained as teams so that they can work together and have the skill sets that are necessary in that environment. This Diplomatic Reserve Corps is designed to do it. I really think it could be remarkably transformative in terms of the way we do business in that regard. It spells out in more detail, and I would commend it to you if you're interested, how this would be recruited, how it would be trained, and how it would be evaluated. But it could be really transformative. It really would, for, a, for the first time in the history of the 250 year history of the State Department, provide us with a, a ready reserve that we could draw on in any crisis situation, in any situation that we needed. Um, and as I say, it also a, has the added advantage of allowing us to tap into the expertise of the private sector, of private American citizens who are willing to do this and willing to work for their country under these circumstances. Um, I, I hope it might even offer some of you <laughs> an opportunity to do this. Let me, before uh, concluding and asking for questions, let me uh, reiterate um, one reason why I think we should invest in the Department of State. Uh, there is a quote that is attributed to the great German leader Otto von Bismarck, that God has a special providence for fools, drunkards, and the United States of America. Whether he actually said that or not, I think we can all agree that relying uh, exclusively on providence to perfect our interests is really not the most prudent or wise thing to do. We need to invest in and strengthen our diplomatic prowess every much as we invest in our military and our intelligence services. The world, as we all know, is a dangerous place, and we as a nation face tremendous challenges and threats. Our diplomats and our diplomacy are in many respects, as I noted, the first line of defense, and we must make them as strong as possible. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please come on up and use the microphone. Um, I can get us started. Earlier in the day, you talked about a good rule of thumb is to try to stay out of the news when you're a diplomat, <laughs> which of course creates this problem that then a lot of people don't know what you're doing. Um, would the State Department ever consider uh, hiring a PR firm to get this information out there? I mean, I know it sounds like a plot of a bad 90s movie, but uh, what, is there any particular strategy for making people broadly aware of the amazing things that we kind of can't tell you about because we did a good job with them? That's, that's a great question. We actually have done Done that in, in the past. Um, and in fact, one of my previous incarnations, and I've had just about every job in the State Department, I can tell you, I worked for Karen Hughes, who was Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy. And she had been uh, an assistant to George Bush and, and worked on his campaign and in the White House. Um, and she uh, made a concerted effort to actually do that. We had a public relations firm, and this was at the height of, in the aftermath of 9 11. Uh, when I, I think the, the message the United States was sending to the world was, our borders are closed, thank you very much, don't come. And, and we heard from a number of American industries, we heard from academia, we heard from others, you know, we need foreigners to come to the United States. It's part of our lifeblood. 
but it also gives us a great strength as a nation that people have been educated in America and higher educational institutions and spent time in the United States. And she worked with, uh, actually with a public relations firm to create those videos you probably saw standing in line waiting to be readmitted to the United States about how wonderful a country we are and how welcoming and other things we are. But we have done some of that. But I think you're right. I think we need to do more. The problem is it's not just, as you say, Carl, that, that um, the rule of thumb in diplomacy is don't make news, but most of what we do is behind the scenes. I mean, we do it in quiet. We would much rather talk to a country very frankly and very openly in quiet and behind the scenes than publicly. A lot of times that sort of public berating or public messaging doesn't work very effectively in diplomacy. So that, it's one of the, the challenges in this regard. Do we have other questions? Oh, yep. Uh, Ambassador, I'm interested in hearing more about the uh, efforts to diversify the core, and uh, in particular, uh, your comment about the traditional view of it being pale male and Yale uh, certainly uh, strikes me as having been at least what I understood of you know 30, 40 years ago. What is the effort uh, made in terms of diversity and ge uh, geography, in terms of uh, recruitment, the extent to which uh, one goes beyond? Uh, uh, people with backgrounds in international relations at schools in the Northeast, um, uh, the efforts to reach out with people, two people or four people who have uh, maybe di more diverse educational backgrounds than perhaps three or four uh, preferred fields. It, it is a real challenge, but it is something I think we've made some headway on. We have now diplomats and residents around the country whose job is primarily recruitment. They will be associated with the university. In, in, in my case, in Colorado, there's one at the University of Denver whose job is not just to, to be at the University of Denver to teach with or to interact with students there, but to go around the state and around several states, actually, to try and, and advertise what it is the State Department does, what our Foreign Service does, why people should think about a career in it. Because you're absolutely right, it's not just that we've recruited from the same pool, narrow pool, historically in, in the Northeast. But we need people with different skill sets. Uh, we need people who know what artificial intelligence means and, and can, can uh, tell us how we can adapt that. We need data scientists. We need people with, with uh, technical backgrounds that historically we have not needed in, in the State Department. And I think there are a couple ways you can do that, obviously. You can recruit a, a generalist and try and train them as that. Or you can recruit somebody who actually has that capacity and that knowledge. And I think the latter is a more efficient way to do it. But it means you need to, to reach people who may never have thought about a career in the State Department. It's remarkable. I've, I've spoken to not just college students, but high school students and others. How many come up afterwards and thought, you know, first of all, I didn't know what the State Department did. But that would be wonderful. You know, I would love to go abroad and represent my country uh, and the American people. And it, it opens doors and it opens eyes about those things. So it's incumbent on us to build on what we have, this diplomatic and resident program and other things. We also have something which used to be called the hometown diplomats to try and encourage diplomats when they were going home to speak to various audiences. Um, but that, of course, implies that they are already geographically diverse and they may not be. So we need, to, we need to make a concerted effort to reach out to them. We have also, in, in many ways, um, looked to uh, efforts to reach out to, uh, to historically black colleges and universities, to um, areas where there are large numbers of Hispanics who may not have thought about uh, coming into the Foreign Service and representing the United States. And I can tell you, as somebody who has led a mission abroad, it is a great source of strength. I mean, it's a source of strength not just in having a diversity of views, which in and of itself is important. One of the worst things in foreign policy is groupthink when it comes to thinking you understand what's going on and you may not. But it's also a great source of pride when you have somebody who's a first generation American representing the United States abroad. Most countries would never think of this. Um, and never put people in that position. But we do that routinely. And I think it, it is, as I say, it, it leads to a diversity of thought, which is always good when it comes to foreign policy, it comes to any problem solving, but it also leads to uh, demonstrating the world our values. 
as a country and what we represent and the opportunity that we provide to everybody. Please. I've got another recruitment question. Uh, when you're thinking about recruiting and retaining talent, who are your biggest competitors? Like, uh, is it other government agencies? Is it private industry? What are your What are your biggest? Who Who are Who's stealing your people from you? That's sort well. Of thing. That's a good question. It It really depends to a large extent. I think, um, frankly, in terms of the quality of the people we get, it's remarkable. Um, the young people and, and sometimes people, the State Department, by the way, doesn't have an age limit on that except 65 for the Foreign Service to retire. So I've had people, we've had people who have joined the, the Foreign Service at 60, uh, knowing they were only going to do two tours before they had to, had to leave the service. Um, we, so we have people with a wide variety of, of backgrounds, experience. The average age, just for your information, of a Foreign Service officer coming into the service is 31. So most have done other things. They have advanced degrees, they've practiced law, they've, they've done something in life before they come into the State Department. That gives us an added advantage. So I actually think on the recruitment level, although we still have some challenges in terms of diversity, we do a very good job of that. Um, you know, in terms of competition, maybe the intelligence community to some extent, although I think it takes different personalities <laughs> and attracts different personalities than maybe the State Department does. But when you talk about, say, artificial intelligence or some of these technical fields, then obviously you're running into some challenges in that regard. You can't pay the salaries that Silicon Valley can pay. Uh, it's simply not going to happen. The U.S. Congress and the U.S. taxpayer is not going to pay that sort of money for someone. And there we might want to think about different models of having people come in from the private sector for a few years. Because it's, first of all, some of this knowledge is perishable. Um, and, and you may only need it for a while, but also, you know, they might be willing to take a, a salary cut for two or three years. They may not be willing to do it for the rest of their life. And, and there, it's remarkable, I think, the degree to which people will do that. They, they feel a sense of, of uh, obligation or, or loyalty or, um, you know, a, a desire to pay back in some way to the United States and are willing to do that for two or three years. And, and so we need, a, and, and part of the flexibility in the personnel system has to be to allow people to come in for just a short while and then go back into the private sector. Please. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Juno. As a way of giving us a concrete examples of what the State Department does, because it's still a little vague to me, I think you do a lot of different things. Could you address the conflict going on right now in the Middle East, Hamas and Israel? Are you involved in negotiating to get our hostages released? What is it the State Department is doing right now with so that situation? It, it, as, as an example, the State Department right now, of course, Secretary Blinken has been intimately involved in trying to um, create some humanitarian pauses to create a situation in which we can address some of the humanitarian challenges in Gaza, at the same time signaling our support for Israel and its right to defend itself against an existential threat. But that's just the sort of tip of the iceberg in many respects. You're seeing the Secretary of State on travels. That's the most visible part. It's on the evening news. But we have a, an embassy there, of course, in, in Jerusalem now, and officers in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, who are in day to day engaged with Israel and talking to the Israelis, often behind the scenes, uh, and often very candid discussions that, again, we don't necessarily want to be public. Our new ambassador there is Jack Liu, who is the former uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, and Chief of Staff and was Deputy Secretary of. Uh, management and resources at the State Department. So he's a very accomplished individual, a non-career. I don't mean to say they should not all, uh, or all should be excluded. He's, he's obviously one who's eminently well qualified for this. But by the way, you know, one of the challenges was getting him out to post. And I have to say, there are an enormous number of embassies that are vacant right now, that we don't have chiefs of mission, confirmed ambassadors in place. There are career professionals who are doing their jobs, but it's not the same to have a charge, and I've been charge and I've been ambassador, I can tell you, as it is to have a confirmed ambassador. There are many countries in which you can't get the meetings you need, you can't get the entree you need, you can't exercise and, and conduct U.S. diplomacy as effectively as you might otherwise do. So Jack Liu, fortunately, uh, had a closure vote and was able to get out, uh, although only two Republicans voted for him to go out. 
but it was vitally important that we have an ambassador there who could meet with the prime minister, meet with the foreign minister, meet with anybody on a given basis. It can't, you can't just leave diplomacy to the Secretary of State to conduct it. It has to be conducted at all different levels. The same was true, by the way, in our mission in, in Egypt. We had no ambassador in Egypt when this crisis broke out. And imagine, the, one of the most important players in the region, and the Senate had not confirmed this person. I, I have to say, and this is my personal opinion, since I'm no longer in government, I can say it, the Senate is broken when it comes to the confirmation process. Something has to change. And the fact that one of my former colleagues has spent 700 days waiting to be confirmed as Assistant Secretary in effect for counterterrorism is indicative of that problem. You can't have these senior jobs go, go vacant when anything can happen to the world. Any crisis can happen at any given moment. You can't wait for something like the horrific Hamas attacks as the, as the trigger for getting these people out to post. That should be automatic. And it used to be automatic. It used to be that, that career ambassadors, like myself, would be, would be routinely voted by the Senate, in, in, often in blocks. And now, because of the way the, the bipartisanship has broken down in the Senate and on Capitol Hill, that's just not the case. So everyone requires an individual vote in many cases. And it's, it, it doesn't make sense to me, frankly, and we need to get back to a more regular order in that regard. But to your question about what do they do, it's, it's really everything under the sun. So I was ambassador to Athens, to Greece, in the height of the economic crisis in Greece, 2010 to 2013. I was involved in everything having to do with what we were trying to do to help Greece through this crisis, helping American business also, um, dealing with issues involving NATO, and the NATO alliance, the, the habitual problems that Greece and Turkey have, uh, and keeping our allies from, from going to blows with one another. But anything we could do to help Greece through this very difficult, almost existential crisis that it was facing in that regard. I worked closely with the State Department, with Department of Treasury, with all different government agencies in trying to advance that mission. But I was the point person for Washington on the ground. And one of the things I did, and one of the reasons why you have a mission, is to tell Washington what's going on. You need ground truth there. We often think we know what's happening in these countries, but I, I can assure you, unless you're there and engaging with them on a daily basis uh, and understanding the culture and the challenges and the politics of what's going on, you're not, you're not really effectively representing your country. And that's why it's important that we have confirmed ambassadors at the head of all of these missions to do exactly that. Thank you. Joanne uh, uh, presented you with a hypothetical. Mine would be uh, your, your in post somewhere, your ambassador. How do you explain to a uh, uh, government to which you're posted what's happening in the U.S.? Uh, what commends the American democracy or the American exper experiment in democracy given what one sees uh, in the U.S. Congress today? What would your answer be? Well, I guess I would start with the, the Churchill quote that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we have problems, we have challenges. And I think, honestly, admitting those challenges openly is part of our strength as a nation. So I, I don't try to paper them over or I don't try to, to um, not identify when we have challenges. I think one of our strengths as a country is the fact that we, for instance, have faced our history um, and and our, it's an ongoing challenge, but we're trying to face our history and, and deal with some of the, the ghosts of the past in that regard. Uh, I think we can be a model. I still think we can be uh, the model for how you do that within the world. But it, there's no question, I think, that the sort of chaos that people see on Capitol Hill, the, the fact that you don't know whether we're going to have a budget on Friday or not, um, doesn't add a, a sense of confidence in, in the United States in that regard. It is a challenge. Um, but as I say, I've, I've often found, I generally find that being truthful about it and being open about it is the best way. But it's also important to remind ourselves, of course, we've been through hard times before. We've had challenges before. Uh, and we've come through those challenges. Uh, the darkest days in our country were the Civil War. We're not today. Um, but I, 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 as I say, I, I, I believe in honesty, and, and I believe in speaking openly about it, uh, and I believe that is one of our strengths as a society. But 
Um, would I like to see a, a more bipartisan effort? Absolutely. It's, it's interesting, because I'm, I'm a historian. I was trained as a historian, so I tend to take very long historical perspective on these things. And if you look at U.S. foreign policy in, in the post-war period, maybe you think it was an aberration in some respects. You know, we ended Second World War as, uh, of course, this, this enormously powerful economy and military in a, in a, a world that we could create the rules for. <coughs> Excuse me. That has changed. But as it's changed, um, it, it strikes me that a lot of the consensus that was behind that foreign policy has, has changed. And some of that may be good. As I say, groupthink in foreign policy is not a great thing, and you all uh, know some of the challenges we faced. I, I think Iraq was a great mistake, uh, in my honest opinion, uh, as a war. We, we should never have, uh, have gone to war with Iraq and tried to replace Saddam Hussein. That was not the best interest of the United States, and it, it, it opened up, as uh, one of the leaders of the State Department said, if you break it, you own it. We broke it, and we owned it, and, and that was a real challenge for us as much as Vietnam was. So we, we have made mistakes as a nation in, in our foreign policy, and I think that sometimes has hurt us with the American people. They think, you know, you people in Washington, you, you people who are guiding our nation don't know what you're doing, and I'm just going to turn my back on it. And I, that's, that's a real challenge. I often said to European audiences that, um, who are complaining that the United States is always meddling, it's always telling us what to do. I said, be careful, because in fact, the natural inclination may be of the United States not to tell anybody what to do and to turn its back on the world. And that's a worse scenario for you and for everybody. And I honestly believe that. I still think we are a force for good in the world. Um, and we make a difference in so many different uh, respects. I think the war in Ukraine is, is a perfect case study of that, where uh, it, were it not for the United States, it's hard to say that Ukraine would have the ability to fight off Russian aggression uh, and to do as well as it has. But it's, it's touch and go. We now see the debate about whether we continue Ukraine funding uh, and support for Ukraine. I think there's still bipartisan consensus, but it sometimes gets obscured in the political dialogue that is, that is going on in Washington and some of the candidates who are uh, pronouncing on these things. And that's a challenge for us because uh, the world's listening, as you say. They're, they're hearing everything that we say. And in fact, it's always uh, astounding to me when I go abroad how much foreigners know about the United States and pay attention to American politics and what American leaders are saying. Uh, so I, I just think we have to be careful about that. We have to encourage the sort of better angels of our nature in terms of our involvement in the world because we have too much at stake, at stake to walk away in that regard. I'm not just talking about Ukraine or, or any particular case, but, but so much of, of the problems we face as a nation, we face as a, as a world, are only going to be addressed if we are together with others, in partnership with others. Uh, and that's why we need diplomacy, frankly, to, to do exactly that. Hi. Um, you said a moment ago uh, that uh, the world is a dangerous place. Um, I'm wondering if that is the approach of the Foreign Service, and mightn't it be better to think of the world as a friendly place. <laughs> and to that end, um, to maybe recruit from the Peace Corps. Uh, we do. You do. Actually, we, we, uh, it, it, there is an entryway from the Peace Corps into the Foreign Service that's sort of accelerated in that regard. But that's a very good point. I, I don't mean to, to paint this completely negative view of the world in terms of the, the threats we face, but it's the best way to capture people's attention sometimes. But I, I agree. I, I think. We as a nation, and sometimes we forget this, first of all, we have enormous strength in, in what is often maligned uh, term of soft power. The number of people who love the United States, who love our values, who love American culture, who've been educated at American institutions. When I was in Greece, it was remarkable because we had a series of prime ministers, all of whom had been educated in higher institutions in the United States. 
And there's nothing like walking into the room of a foreign leader who has been educated in the United States. It's a great source of strength and, and, and power for us and influence in that regard. They won't necessarily do exactly what we want them to do, but they understand us, they sympathize with us, they share our values in many respects. That's an enormous source of our, of our power and our influence in the world. Um, so I, I don't mean to suggest that, that it's all danger, but I, I do mean to suggest that there are threats looming on the horizon. And those threats are not just the sort of traditional war or, um, or other things. They're, they're famine, there's climate change, there's impact of mass migration now. Uh, all of these things transcend borders and, and transcend the ability of any one nation to, to deal with them. And we need allies. We need to be able to collectively address it. And one way to do that is exactly as you say, to build rapport with people, to build uh, uh, cooperation with people. Well, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me. It's sort of discouraging to your point, Bruce, about um, sort of consensus and where things look on the, in, in f from foreign perspective in Washington. PEPFAR now. This is the president's, uh, this was begun under, under George Bush, the president's uh, uh, proposal to address AIDS and the, and the threat of AIDS in, in the third world, and particularly in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. We have saved as many as 25 million lives with this program. It has broad bipartisan support, has had broad bipartisan support, but now is being threatened because some think that it is being used for it's gotten up in the debate about, uh, uh, you know, about right to life and, and, and women's right to choose and other things, when in fact it has very little to do with that, nothing to do with that. It, it has to do with saving lives. It has to do with, with uh, protecting women and infants and ensuring that, that this horrible disease does not wreck the damage and create the damage that it would otherwise create. And the loss would have been significant in many of these countries. Uh, it's a shame that it's been politicized now, that there is a political debate about whether to continue to fund PEPFAR, which is probably the most successful foreign assistance the United States has ever provided, period. Um, and I, I hate to see that, honestly. I, I, it's, a, it's a real challenge. But that program, that sort of uh, uh, effort and assistance uh, has won us great credit throughout the world. It builds friends. It, it, people understand what we do and what we stand for and why we're there. Um, and I just think we need more of that. I, so I don't mean to, you know, it's, it's not always uh, a threat, but it, but it may be, it's a challenge, and it's a challenge that's gonna require cooperation. Please. So you made an introduction comment about climate change. I did. And um, so I'm curious what the state, what are the one or two or three maybe top things within the State Department with how the State Department is dealing with climate change, promoting dealing with climate change? What's the agenda within the State Department for climate change? So the main thing the State Department does is the lead as the lead organi organization for negotiations on climate change. Uh, so actually former Secretary John Kerry is the head of that effort. Um, and he is negotiating in COP and all of the, the conferences of the parties and other things to, to make sure that we are addressing the standards, the, the challenges that we face to holding countries accountable, but to making sure we're working together in, in this regard to address climate change. And as you know, it's not an easy task. Um, there are a lot of countries, developing countries, that, that uh, will say, well, the United States, it's nice that you now have decided fossil fuels are no good, uh, but why didn't you decide 50 years ago before you did all this damage to us? And, and what are you going to do for us? How are you going to help us develop and provide electricity and, and assistance to our people? So it, it's incumbent upon us to try and address that. Uh, it's going to be something we're going to have to work with our allies in Europe and, and Asia to do. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated math problem when, it, when you think about how to deal with climate change. But it's a perfect example of something where we could do everything right on our own. It isn't going to do enough unless we have others with us in that. So the State Department is the lead negotiator for this. How do you get these under countries involved? And John Kerry is, uh, by the way, was a wonderful Secretary of State, but is passionate about this. Uh, I don't know that we've had a secretary who was that devoted to, to climate as well as to oceans, I mean, to environmental issues. Uh, I think it was a great choice to lead this effort. Um, and it's, uh, it's tough, but, but he's doing a lot. 
that's, that's primarily what the State Department does. We also have some assistance we provide. We work together with AID in terms of that assistance. It's also marshalling the, the whole of government effort in this regard, and that's to a large extent what the State Department does within government and what our missions do abroad. It's not just the State Department, it's also getting AID, it's getting Department of Energy, it's getting all of these players who have a role in this to, to work together in, in a common effort there to address this issue. Our professions tend to leak into our personal lives. I'm married to a project planner, and so we have a very organized household. A friend of hers is married to a psychotherapist, and uh, conflicts are very interesting in their household. I'm curious, in your home, have you ever lost a disagreement, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador? <laughs> My wife is sitting in the audience, so I have to be truthful here. Uh, I lose them all the time. It was a good friend of mine who uh, was ambassador and said, you know, when I'm, when I'm speaking to the country team, this is usually the group of leaders of various agencies you're speaking to, everybody listens to what I say. I go home to the dinner table and nobody listens to what I say. <laughs> and that's true, I think, for a lot of us in that regard is, uh, you know, it is a family enterprise and my wife and my three sons sacrificed enormously so I could have this career. I think at the end of the day, they feel like they gained something from it. But try taking a 13-year-old abroad uh, and ripping them out of their local school and, and, you know, let me know what the reaction is from that. It could be a tough thing to do. Um, as I say, I, I think at the end of the day, the benefits far outweigh the, the challenges in that regard. But, but it's, um, it can be trying. It, it, but it's, it, it gets back to the point I was making about on our personnel system. We need to provide as many opportunities as we can for spouses. I mean, it's not... Getting back to the comment about pale male and Yale, we're not just recruiting men, we're not just recruiting single people, we're recruiting families in some respects and sending them abroad. And if you have a spouse who has a, 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 a very successful career, it's hard to get them or convince them that they should stop doing what they were doing and, and just follow you around the world in that regard. So we need to create more opportunities. We actually negotiate agreements with foreign governments so that some of our spouses can work in those countries, because many employment laws, labor laws, don't permit that in many circumstances. We create on the basis of reciprocity. We'll allow them to have their spouses work in Washington or New York or wherever it might be if they will allow us to do that as well. I think too, though, that the changing pattern of work, a lot more people working remotely, a lot more people able to telework, uh, is helping in that regard. But it's, it, it's something we recognize as a challenge in terms of not just recruitment, but also retention of people. Um, and because what, you know, I, when we joined, I joined the Foreign Service, we didn't have any children. Um, and then you have children and you realize they have needs, <laughs> believe it or not. Some of them may have special educational needs. It, it's enormously complicated math in that regard in terms of how do you ensure that we can send these families abroad and provide support. Um, and that was one of the lessons I learned as, as ambassador is that you aren't just um, in charge of the mission, you're in charge of everything about those people who are living under your protection. Uh, I'm in charge with their safety and security. I, I knew, I, I said to people in Washington, you know, I was in Washington as assistant secretary, which is sort of the equivalent of, of ambassador. I didn't know where people lived. I didn't know where their kids went to school and it wasn't my problem. When I went overseas, it was everything about it, where they lived, their safety, the security, the school, uh, because it was going to affect my ability to recruit people to come work for me in that mission. So I had to worry about every aspect of it. Um, so it's a much more challenging in environment in that regard, uh, one where we can't neglect the needs of our families or the needs of our spouses and be successful. But I lose arguments all the time. <laughs> all out there for time. Our thanks very much to your spouse, to your children, and for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. That was Ambassador Dan Smith in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation, produced in collaboration with KTOO. It was recorded November 15, 2023, at KTOO in Juno, with support from the University of Alaska Southeast and Core Alaska Kensington Mine, and additional support by Ramada by Wyndham, DreamHost.com, and individual contributors. This presentation was made possible with the support of the American Academy of Diplomacy and their partners, Arizona State University and the Una Chapman Cox Foundation.